Uh, this is what I got uh, as a stockholder of Disney full, Disney. full disclosure, I am a Disney stockholder. I'm not a happy one. I'm a pretty pissed off one, but I am a Disney stockholder. Um, yeah, so uh, in their statement, Trian announced, Trian Partners announced that they're nominating two candidates for the Walt Disney Company board. Uh, they The headline reads, Bit believes the Disney board's lack of focus, alignment, and accountability has resulted in chronic underperformance at one of the world's most iconic companies. Now, uh, the important thing to know is that Nelson Peltz has uh, nominated himself and he has nominated a gentleman known as James, a.k.a. Jay Rasulo, who any of us who have been longtime Disney uh, company watchers know that he is the former CFO, Chief, yep. Officer, Chief Financial Officer, of the Walt Disney Company, and his tenure ended in about 2015. However, he was at the Walt Disney Corporation uh, dating back into the 80s, uh, through the 90s, um, into the 2000s. So he's a long-time uh, person. He's a long, he was a long-time uh, uh, employee and executive there. Um, there was some uh, discussion prior to his departure that he might ascend to the top spot as an executive uh, at Disney, he was in competition with another gentleman named Tom Skaggs, who some of you who have been following Midnight's Edge and uh, Midnight's Edge After Dark religiously over the last couple of years will know that uh, recently Bob Iger brought back Tom Skaggs as a consultant to do God knows what and help out in God knows what way that has had absolutely zero evidence of doing anything since he was brought back as a consultant. But uh, there's no love lost uh, um, between uh, Rasulo. So to have Jay Rasulo on the side of Nelson Peltz is a massive thermonuclear nomination for someone to be on the board of directors. Now, this statement, I'm just going to highlight two things. Uh, first is a, is a statement made by Jay Rasulo where he says, the Disney I know and love has lost its way. As independent voices in the boardroom, Nilsson and I are confident that the combination of my decades of experience at Disney, Nilsson's significant boardroom skills and history of driving positive strategic change, and our combined consumer brands, expertise, and financial acumen will be additive to the Disney board. With a shareholder mandate, Nilsson and I look forward to helping the board and management reorient the company towards delighting its consumers again, and driving significant value for its owners. And the second thing I want to uh, mention, highlight has to do with how they start this thing, where they note that Tree and Fund Management, which beneficially owns $3 billion, with a B, of common stock in the Walt Disney Company. And if you currently look now at the Walt Disney board uh, that's currently out there, who wants to take a guess as the value of all the stock that's held by everyone that's currently on the board? Who wants to play the price is not right amongst the board? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, zero. I'm going to say zero. <laughs> uh, it is more than zero, but less than $3 billion. Next guess. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is a great range. I will recluse myself from guessing because I know the answer. But I will say I was in shock when I found out. All right. All right. In the chat. Let's put up between Nilsson Peltz has three billion and he wants two board seats. In the chat, let's make this interactive. Guess how much is the value of the stock of the uh, excluding Iger, who's the CEO? The value of the stock held by all the other board members that are on the Disney board right now. Let me see what you got in chat. I'm gonna say, just because I'm gonna throw it out there, because I haven't seen this whole thing yet. It's got to be less than what he owns, just because of the way you're asking. So 2.5 billion. Lower. Ooh. 1 billion. Lower. Oh, Lower wow. than 1 billion? Lower. <laughs> That's 300K. There's 10, there's 10 people on the board. Lower. I was literally what? closer than all of you guys. The 300K? <laughs> you played the prices right. That doesn't higher count. Higher. It's at least in the millions, isn't it? He said between you had to say one dollar to win. It's between three hundred thousand and <laughs> it's way higher than three hundred thousand, but way lower than one billion. Keep going. Half a billion. Lower. Oh, come on, lower than that. <laughs> yeah, the half a billion would be five hundred million. Lower. Two hundred and fifty million. Lower. No. Fifty million. It's around eighty million, isn't it? 
15 million is the magic number we're looking oh, 15. for. 15. Okay. One 15. five. That is utterly insane. Andre, I was what in say shock. You? Yeah, and I was in shock when I found that out. Here you have a board. And remember, the whole purpose of a board, this is, we're, we're, I'm sure we'll get into this, but to me, this is really important. The whole purpose of a board, why you have a board in the first place, is because the board is supposed to be representative of the shareholders. Oftentimes, you have too many shareholders that the CEO can answer to all of them, which is why you have a board. And this board is assigned by the shareholders, and it very frequently will have major shareholders in it. And the reason for that is because they have a personal stake in the company. They are invested in it, so it's going to be important for them for it to actually work out. This is something the government want. The government wants uh, corporations and companies to be successful because that way they pay tax, which is why you have all of these rules and regulations on company governance, which are designed for the company to be profitable so that the government may tax the company. Now, all of this boils down to that the Board should have a large percentage of shareholders so that they have a personal stake and be appointed by the shareholders. The shocking thing here is that not only does this board not have that personal stake in the company, they're also not appointed by the shareholders. So how is this board then capable of representing shareholder interest? Mike, you take it from there. Well, that brings up an interesting question um, about uh, about independence related to the Walt Disney Company, because the tenure of the board members at Walt Disney is a bunch of rookies. It's like, uh, you know, when you look at a company this big, it's it, the analogy that I would draw. It would be like taking a vaulted team like the L.A. Dodgers or the New York Yankees and giving it essentially the roster of, say, the Oakland A's in baseball. Um you know, it's a bunch of uh, it's a bunch of uh, uh, low low value add um, people that are sitting on the board of this of this company. Almost all of whom uh, either are directly inspired or nominated by uh, by Walt Di by uh, Bob Iger, or um, or if they weren't uh, directly nominated by Bob Iger, one of the investors that's friendly to Bob Iger and the things that uh, Disney wants to do such as uh, BlackRock or one of the other shareholders, um, has been the one that designated who they wanted to sit in the director's seat. Yeah. Let's look at how this is being covered in the news. I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, stop share, present, share screen, just so we can scan what's happening here out and about in the world today. Let's go here. Uh, by the way, they're, uh, the new board members, uh, for a company that touts itself as, uh, uh, as uh, embracing diversity, both of the board members that they've got are um, two white guys. Anyway, the Hollywood Reporter, Disney's, Disney activist fight escalates and Nelson Peltz, as Nelson Peltz nominates former CFO Jay Rasulo for a board seat. Uh, that's how the Hollywood, um, Hollywood uh, Reporter covers it. Um, Disney responds to unsolicited nominations um, and ex Disney CFO um, it is uh, Disney uh, responds and says that they're, uh, they're in their formal response. Disney has formally responded to activist shareholder tree and fund management's unsolicited effort to nominate its co founder, Nelson Peltz, and ex Disney CFO James Rasulo to the media's giant board of directors. The company said a board committee will review the nomination. So don't worry, Andre, they're going to review this nomination. Yeah. But it also made a point of noting that Trian has teamed up with former Marvel Entertainment boss Ike Perlmutter. Uh oh, Disney earlier this year rejected a request from Trian for a presence on the board. It has described Perlmutter as having a long-standing personal agenda against Bob Iger. Andre oh, yeah. Perlmutter, a long company. <laughs> Perlmutter, a longtime associate of Pearls, was removed from the Disney executive ranks by Iger reportedly after clashing. With Marvel chief Kevin Feige over film budgets, Rasulu, meanwhile, at one time was considered a potential successor to Iger. His run lasted. Okay, we already covered all that. Uh, so basically, he's immensely qualified, and he knows Disney inside and out. 
meaning he's probably the most competent and qualified person to sit on a Disney board that's ever been, is what we're saying here. That's right. In a statement, read it in full below, uh, <laughs> Disney defended its existing board. Quote, Disney has an experienced, diverse, and highly qualified board that is focused on the long-term performance of the company's strategic growth initiatives, including the ongoing transformation of its businesses, the succession planning process, and increasing shareholder value. The board's governance and nominating committee, which evaluates all director nominations, will review the tree of nominees and then provide a recommendation to the board. Gee, yeah. wonder what's going to happen there, Andre. And I also wonder what is missing in this deadline Hollywood write-up. Well, I can answer that. What is missing is the bulk of the initial statement and press release and letter to shareholders from the Trian Group, where they basically tear apart not just Bob Iger, but the entire board and their competency and their suitability for being on the board at all. This is something that is not really covered in Deadline Hollywood's piece. They just further the Disney and Bob Iger cause, whereas what is in here? Look at this. Uh, this is a statement. Since Mr. Iger's first earnings call after returning, so here they're first dealing with what has happened in the, the last year. Tens of billions of shareholder value has been lost. Uh, all kinds of estimates have, have dropped dramatically and studio content continues to disappoint consumers, slowing the speed of the flywheel and threatening future earnings growth. And more generally, Disney appears no closer to adequately address the compensation misalignment, governance and succession issues that have played the company for decades. Basically, the board isn't doing their job. And here is where they really get into it. The root cause of Disney's underperformance is a board that is too closely connected to a long tenured CEO and too disconnected from shareholder interest. And this, of course, is entirely right. The board, we believe, lacks objectivity as well as focus, alignment, and accountability. All true. Uh, so basically, this is uh, this is delivering a black eye to Iger and the board. There was another statement here. We don't have it on screen, but there was another statement where they basically attack Bob Iger himself, and they subtly attack. It's a bit higher up, I think, and they subtly attack his uh, preferred strategy of going after Bob Iger. Uh, it's, yes, it says so right here. Uh, because first they say that, um, uh, that the subpar performance has destroyed value for shareholders. Disney stock has underperformed the stocks of Disney's self-selected proxy peers and the broader market for blah, 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 blah. Furthermore, it has underperformed since Bob Iger was first appointed CEO in 2005. And then they emphasize that he has been the CEO since 2005 up until today. Um, and over that period, he has always been either CEO or executive chairman for all but 11 months. So basically, everything has gone to hell since Iger came aboard, and he cannot blame Chapek because he has been in charge for all but eleven months. No, I gotta That's ask. What they're saying here? That's Couldn't... this is like a direct takedown of Bob Iger's blaming Chapek. Yes, carry now, on, Tom. I, I don't know how this works in a corporate setting, so I gotta ask you guys, you and Mike specifically, is there some sort of point or any kind of charge that can be made on Peltz's part towards Disney that that entire time Chapek, Chapek was in office, it was pretty clear that Bob was working against him and the company, which would in turn work against the company's better interests. This is not the time, but the, but uh, there would come a time for such accusations, wouldn't it, uh, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's uh, that would be like a later uh, later round uh, in this fight. Like right now, here's he, right now there. Nelson Peltz is saying, "I want to nominate to the board my two directors." And here's what the thing is: is that the, the way Disney structured is the board is going to evaluate these, and guess what they're going to say? They're going to say no. 
They are going to say right, no. That's where I'm coming from. I can already guarantee no you that's going to happen. Yeah. They, here's what I think is going to happen. I don't, Andre, tell me what you think. I don't think there's any way that the board take that take take because knowing the way Disney is, they don't they do, they don't admit they're wrong about anything. They double down and they're delusional. They 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 don't admit failure. They double down and they're delusional. That's how this company operates in every way, shape, or form. There's nothing about this company that is uh, the, uh, that, that, that they deserve the benefit of the doubt for anything. I think what's going to happen is they're going to deny this nomination. They already are. And well, yeah, they already. You're right. You're right, Andre. The thing that you just read. You're right. They're already basically saying um, F Nelson Pelt and F his nomination. So they're going to deny that. Then what we've got is we've got coming up. Guess what happens in the spring, Andre? Well, that's when you have the shareholder meeting, and they do tease that towards the end here. So that's when the shareholders are going to vote because that's kind of like what they what they've done here. They are no longer asking Bob Iger and the board to be on the board. That's not what they're doing here. This letter here is sent to all of the shareholders because they're going to the shareholders directly. The end here reads, Trian expects that the 2024 annual meeting will take place in the spring of 2024. And this is the sentence I thought was the most brilliant. Shareholders do not need to take any action at this time. Right. When I got this, it's a threat. when I got, when I got, when I, I had gotten this in my email, when I got this, I was just like, I think they're talking to me. And well, they have they two are. things. There's yeah. two things shareholders need to take action on at that time. The one is the, the pr primary subject of this conversation. The other is that IATSE renegotiates, renegotiates its uh, contract starting in spring. And if they don't get a deal, they go on strike, which again shuts down Hollywood, which then it affects the stockholders and has a ripple effect. So yes, stockholders, shareholders need to actually get on Disney's butt to get not only the board in order, to, but to make sure that they don't allow another Hollywood strike to happen two years in a row, because they they can't handle that either. Yeah, because that'd basically be three years of shutting down, which is what they've been doing now since. But don't worry, Bob Iger, Tom. He, you don't understand, Tom. Script. You guys don't understand. <laughs> Hold on. We're still recovering from the COVID implications that occurred that affected our company. That's what Bob would say. Yep. And then he would say, well, we're going to focus on quality over quantity. We're going to focus on quality over quantity because we're a great st storytelling company that tells stories. Yeah, we've done so for a hundred years with yeah, all well, the good 97. people that are gone now. <laughs> I'd say 97 years they, they've done that. Yeah. You know, I don't doubt that there's issues that they have from the from the Kung flu, but I know that none of the BS that's going on with them now has been because of that. A well, lot of things that have been done is because of recovered. Iger's doing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And but they legitimately, uh, but, sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, no, I just say, but this statement right here, shareholders do not need to take any action at this time. Oh, but shareholders will be paying attention because what I read that sentence as is that this is just the beginning. Now they're going to start campaigning. They're going to start showing how incompetent Iger and the board is. And that won't be difficult, even if uh, if the entertainment media press will do everything they can to run cover for Iger. And building on that, I let, that's this statement here. There is much that can be done to revive Disney and restore the confidence of Disney show, shareholders and Trian looks forward to discussing these opportunities with our fellow shareholders over the coming months. Yeah. Dun, and, dun, dun. Uh, and you know what that tells me? They look forward to discussing this with our fellow shareholders, not with the board members, with the shareholders. What struck me about this is that he's only asking for two board seats. But I think that they'll be asking for much more than that come this actual shareholder meeting. You know, I got a question for like Price of Reason, Clobby, the other boys on the on the panel. Just, I mean, when you hear that Nelson and his group has three billion in stock and everybody else has 15 million, wouldn't you guys think that we should ask for like, like Nelson should ask for three or four slots minimum too, like Andre said? I I see why we're having, starting off small. I mean, you want to start off small and then, and then build more. That way it doesn't look like you're trying to have a, well, hostile takeover per se. 
as they like to use that terminology. Start small, then work your way up to getting more. Also, feel think- the room. How many people on the board are just towing the the line as opposed to actually sharing the real feelings because of fear of reprisal, right? That's a good. Yeah. This feels good to me like a right. game that's very rigged, uh, much like how the media is rigged and all these other things. And yes, oh, the logic God. says that with three billion, it makes it seem like he should have more say and should have to be able to sit on the board. But things don't exactly work that way. And Disney is notorious for somehow twisting narratives and getting their way with their own kind of internal politics. I guess my question that I wanted to ask the both of you, both Andre and Mexican Iron Man, is that do you think that in spring he has a real shot at getting on this board? Because if he does, I think that's that's a complete... That's like dropping a bomb on this whole Disney thing if he manages to somehow get in there. What do you think, Mike? I think... Um... I, I would if you asked me that question a year ago or a year and a half, uh, yeah, a year ago, I'd say no way, no how. Uh, but much has happened in the last year. Uh, we've got a stagnant stock that uh, is still in the 90s, uh, dipped as low as the high 70s. Number two, we've got flop after flop, which these box office, you know, people push back. I mean, say, well, they can lose 50, 100, 200 million here and there on a movie. And it doesn't matter because they make that in the parks and every few weeks and and that subset. But these failures are pretty large and glaring because they're in the media and these box office numbers are what they are. The third thing uh, that I'll point to has to do with um, the emergence of Nelson Peltz in general and how he's coalesced support and alignment with Ike Perlmutter. He's not like an investor out in the wind. He's 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 he's. I mean, my God, he's got Jay, a former CFO on the side. He's got um, he's got Ike Perlmutter, largest individual shareholder. He's no, you know, he, that is an, a third sort of gravitational effect. And the other thing that I'll point to is that if someone were to tell me that those investor calls would have gone the way they did, I would have said no way, no how. But I think there, I think I am not an isolated case. I think there are many individual investors that are sitting around, some with 10 shares of stock, some with thousands of shares. Um, there's people all over that are pissed off that they don't know if they can trust Disney+. Plus. They can't trust Disney Entertainment and their movies with their children. They can't trust the experience they're going to get at the parks. And I think that uh, a reckoning now is more likely than not to come due. And if, if Nielsen Pels can get the word out to as many people like me to be in alignment with him then yes there is the possibility that this thing that this could go uh against uh bob Iger and team and even if they lose in this maneuver this fall there still might be a way to win and i'm going to tell you what this could be let's just say for example nielsen makes his move and he doesn't have the votes and he can't elect a new board slot or new board directors they could paint themselves into a corner where if the company doesn't financially perform which by the way it won't because we know what this management team and the internal rot. We know there's no creative talent inside Disney. We know the board is full of shit. We know the managers are woke as fuck. So we're not going to get any great results. So what they're going to do is they're going to paint themselves into a corner. And if they resist Nelson on this round, then it's going to be a wholesale lock, stock, and uh, barrel. And it's going to be really, really ugly. And the company will be in shambles. And then truly, right before it's about to go under, maybe it could be rebuilt. That's everything, I think, Andre. Uh, I'm curious, Mike, you know this better than me. How many shareholders does he have to win over? Or rather, we know he is not going to win over the likes of BlackRock, right? Right. How many of Disney's total shareholders can he win over versus how many does he need to win over? That's a good point. Yeah, I do. I do. I don't actually know. Here, I can tell you the answer. That could talk about something else. Hold on. Let me find out. Hold on. Hold yeah, on. because I that's like the real question here, because there are some of those shareholders and uh, Bob Iger, we know he has uh, gotten his friends to buy up more shares on his behalf to strengthen his grip on the company, specifically mm-hmm. to vote against Nelson Peltz come, come spring. Uh, so some of those shareholders will never vote for anyone but Iger, either because they're friends of Iger or because, in the case of BlackRock, 
Iker is doing there. Okay, I can answer this question now. You ready? Go for it. Yes. All right. So here's what we've got. Uh, let me just share this on the screen. For the benefit of those watching at home. Whoa. Hold on. Take the super chat. Or There we go. All right. Um, so... Vanguard has 14 billion worth of stock. BlackRock has 11 billion worth of stock. State Street has 6 billion worth of stock. Morgan Stanley, which we know has just been nominated to the board, has 4 billion worth of stock. Yeah. Morgan Stanley, they're like BlackRock, so they're team Iger solidly. I don't know anything about geode capital management. Neither do I. So let's just say that's 10, 21, 31, 32, 35, 35 billion of stock. So uh, Trion Fund, State Farm, I don't know how they're going to vote. I, I don't know how they would vote, but they're, I don't know much about them. I don't, I don't know State Farm or Geo yeah. in terms of their finance. I think we can reasonably assume that Bulni, that's Bank of New York Mellon and Bank of America, they are likely in uh, team uh, camp team Iger. So if we then look at the percentage, so he's not going black or getting BlackRock, that's 8%. He's not getting that, so then, then we're up to 13%. Uh, uh, plus well, four, we're at 14, 16%, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 18, 21, 21.5, 22, 23, 24, 25. So literally almost a third of the company is owned by these woke-ass investors. Yeah, so, yeah, so let's say that thir he's definitely not getting 30% of the company. At very least, he's definitely not getting those 30%. Right. So the so the target here are all of the remaining uh, seventy percent. That's who we're looking for. Those are the ones that are required to support him. And how many of those seventy percent? I'm sure there's probably more woke people among there, but of those seventy percent, how many would be needed to actually get uh, kick two two board members out and replace them? with uh, Nelson Peltz and uh, and uh, the former Disney CFO. But just to be clear here, they are not looking to add two members to the board. They're not going to pack the board any more than Iger already has. I mean, I'm gonna, They're looking I'm, to kick two members off and replace them with their own people. Right. I'm going to tell you that Nelson Peltz is going to have to make a pitch to everybody and anybody like me. If he's yeah. going to get this done, exactly. This is, That's what I mean. going, this is in order to get this done. This is a lot, a lot like politics, Andre. What you're pointing out, it's a lot like we. It's almost like we can't rely on the Democrats or the Republicans to fix this thing. We got to make a numbers this, game. It's a numbers game, and we got to make Disney great again. Yeah, I have a theory. I think Go that close closer to spring 2024, they're going to announce a few quote unquote partnerships. They're doing something with Apple. They're doing something here and there. Some things that'll prop up the stock. And I'm not saying I know he gave dividend now and it was a measly dividend, but they're going to try to do something to wow, to make it seem to the shareholders like something great is happening. Oh, even, if sure. it's even if it's just something temporary, just do like a smoke screen as if great things are happening. And once all of that passes, then the stock will drop back. So, Mike, I am, I'm going to ask you something. I'm sure I'm not the only one, whether it's the power chat, who's wondering this. Why, whether you're someone who has stock or investor, or if you're just someone who's even like a parent who you know, wants Disney to be good again, or just anyone wants to be Disney again, why should people be more hopeful about this now compared to, let's just say, the zillion other times we've been trying to hope for change? Because it's been a swing and a miss more than we can ever count and i would like for this to be a thing but i'm still not exactly holding my breath here i you answered that question not to be rude but I, nick i answered no that no question. no go for it I answer that question 10 15 minutes ago the things have changed now versus i know year and half ago. Have... i mean there's now an organized investor that's leading an activist campaign he's a he's you know he's grouped up his allies disney's had public failures in the marketplace with its films I mean, I covered all that a minute ago. That's why. Oh, I, I know we, I know we did, and we've we've seen failures. We've seen a lot of these things now, and I'm just. I can I can to... answer you in detail. What's different? The difference I... is that the last the last few times when you have been promised change, 
you have been promised change by the very people that Nelson Peltz and the Trian group want to get rid of. You are now, you're not, and actually you're not even being promised change. What is happening right now is that you have Nelson Peltz who are pointing out that these motherfuckers who are running Disney right now, they are liars, they are incompetent, they have promised change time and time again, and it hasn't happened. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. If these people are allowed to continue to, to, to run, nothing is going to change. There will be no recovery for Disney. The only way to change Disney is to force the actual skilled people in by force to get rid of these incompetence and gradually start changing the company from within. No one is promising you anything here. The only implied promise here is that if you want to see Disney get better, and you're a Disney shareholder, you need to vote for Nelson Peltz. Because if you don't, you have no hope in hell of anything getting better. That's the only promise here. Let's take a quick look at who's going to review the Peltz nomination. We have Amy Chang. I wonder how she's going to vote. Procter, yeah. Procter & Gamble. Uh, we very have, skills in entertainment. We have Michael Froman from the Council on Foreign Relations. Ah, WEF chill. Nice. Yeah, World Economic Forum guy right there, everybody. Uh, we've got Maria Elena Lagomasino. Wonder how she's going to vote. She's from uh, WE Family Offices, an office serving high net worth families. What the hell is that? Officer of Gen... This, this sounds like some kind of like abortion thing. Yep, and of course, Family Mark control. Mark Parker from Nike. Gee, I wonder if that company's woke or not. Anyone in the chat got any insight on that one? Hmm. Uh, meanwhile, there we have a modern day human slaver. Yeah, so those are our, those are the people that uh, are going to review this, uh, and they are they are the board. This is the board: two, four, six, yeah. eight, ten, eleven. And Nick, for all those people that have promised change that hasn't come, these are the people that need to get kicked kick the fuck out and that's what yeah need that's, more than a, two that's a whole lot of rot there you look yeah. at that that is almost an entirely here, Mike, let's, move on. let's move on with the other board members okay yeah, yeah all right no, who go, wants go to look it. at mary t barra who's been a director since 2017 uh chair of general motors since uh 2016 uh and uh let's see well i don't know what she worked at general wait motors, isn't but... she the one that uh let a strike happen in her company recently yes yes <laughs> That is exactly who this is. Oh, uh, we got Safra Katz from Oracle. Yeah, they know a lot about entertainment companies and how to run theme parks. Not. Uh, we already covered Amy Chang. She doesn't know shit about how to run theme parks or studios. I don't know what she's, she's very doing. diverse, though. Oh, bing, that's going to make her parks better just because she's diverse. Oh, and then we got Francis D'Souza. We know him. He's a. Uh, Biotech guy, president of Illumina. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, director nice. since 2018. You see a pattern? 17, 18, 18, 21, 18. Oh, Carolyn Everson, she came aboard in 2022. She's coming from Instacart. Boy, that <laughs> brings a lot of uh brain power from Instacart. Yeah, well, let's go ahead and take everything she learned at Instacart. And that, I'm sure yeah, she was also at uh, Meta. So, again, this is another wokester and uh, and someone that wants to enslave the rest of humanity. Those of us Are... who know Carolyn Everson know her as Karen Everson. Uh, Are any of these board members point. personal net worth uh, like less than 15 million on their own? Never mind all of them combined. Oh God! Inclusive growth. I caught the words <laughs> right after Mastercard. Yeah, but you see, this is the guy we already covered. Like this is yeah. the WEF chill. Like yeah, th yeah. this is to do the Ooh. director too. since 2018. Oh, of course. Yeah. Then we got Bob. Hi, Bob. We already covered Maria. She's been a director since 2015. We already covered her. Uh, Calvin McDonald. Yeah. All right. He's the CEO from Lululemon Athletic. He just oozes metrosexual. Uh, oh, that's a word you haven't heard in 20 years. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Cal, well, I'm sure I'm sure his expertise in uh, fabrics helps uh, it's really going to get our studios and He doesn't quite look gay, script. He just looks 
Yeah. <laughs> and Jerrica Rice, 2019. He's coming from CVS. Oh, good. Yeah, here we have another we pharmacy sure. dude. Yeah, we make sure our COVID protocols are in place at the parks. Yeah. Have you noticed? See, I when I look at this, I see two things. Number one, I see a glaring lack of tenure. There's everybody here has been been thrown on this thing since 2017, 18, 22, 20, blah, 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 blah. There's no one here that has any kind of legacy knowledge of this company. And number two, there's no one on this board that knows shit. Not one person about running a theme park, running studios, let alone a media offering called Disney Plus. But they, what they do know, though, like the recurring themes here are pharmaceutical and uh, wanting to basically control everyone. I mean, these are like the recurring trends of these board members. Drugs and administration, man. <laughs> yeah. So, so Nick, you wonder now why they don't deliver on their promises to change the company around? Oh, I knew the answer the wrong. Why. I'm just wondering why why people should be hopeful now compared to then because now there's you know there's been talks okay. you know you have you have no reason to be hopeful unless Pel Pelts wins out. No one is promising you anything here. Oh, I know. No, I know. I'm just wondering because I know we we're, there's a lot of skepticism and a lot of people. I guess you could say are being hopeful. I myself am not personally hopeful. I'm just watching, and seeing how this plays out. Yeah. I would say that the, the only reason to be hopeful now is that here is a genuine chance of change, whereas previously mm -hmm. there was none. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've also noticed that the media ma uh, made a point to remind everybody that Ike Perlmutter is also connected here, and he's known as a guy that's friends with uh, Orange Man. So I think that's also their way of laying the groundwork over time to uh frame these people uh pelts and his associates as people that may be tied to somebody like that oh but they already are we know this and this is going to be like one of their things because they are consumer driven and that's what the orange man really is so of course they're going to do like an ideological battle here if you are a good virtuous citizen of the world to paraphrase bob Iger. You will, of course, be Team Iger because he's a progressive citizen of the world. Doesn't really care about, you know, like profits. They have a they have a larger, more important role at Disney that shareholders are just expected to pay for. That's where I find the thirty percent thing interesting because I I find it's you know, with with votes, uh, particularly on party lines, thirty percent is what you can kind of expect. You know, like you, you won't ever lose mm. more than you, you won't, you won't go below 30%, right? So yeah. Iger's camp has that 30%. And chances are, if Peltz is organized enough, he can probably get 30% of people who are in our camp. It would take a lot of organization to contact everybody, right? But then you have the people in the middle, and those are the ones you have to convince the people who are maybe just not paying complete attention to what's going on. Who normies. aren't really on one side or the other, you know? Well, in this so, case, though, the normies are Disney shareholders. So you would hope that he's able to win over everyone that actually wants to make money on Disney shares. This isn't like a normal election of like the, the average lot that just happens to be in the area. These are people that have already paid for Disney shares in the first place. You would hope that they would have an interest in, in seeing... Uh, their investment increase in value. And then here's when you look at the board of directors, here's the other fascinating thing. I forgot to mention this earlier. So we have our audit committee. The audit committee assists the board of directors in its oversight of the integrity of the company's financial statements, compliance with legal and regulatory, independence of auditors, performance of the internal audit function. Well, again, who's on this committee? The, the guy from uh, CVS. Not an accountant, by the way, for those playing at home. Uh, Francis D'Souza from Illumina. Uh, hashtag not an accountant also. He looks kind of gay. Safra <laughs> Katz from uh, Oracle, I guess. I mean, Oracle does make financial. She looks like AI. 
And then the <laughs> funny thing is, is that when we look behind the governance nominating committee, we go to the executive committee and look who's on the executive committee. Look how many people are on the executive committee, which essentially decides everything for the rest of the board. How many people are there, Andre? Two. Wow. He just stepped away, but two. Yes. I, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Two. Exactly two. You have the slaver and you have Iger. That, oh, that, that. two there are. <laughs> but which one is the master and which is the which apprentice? Which one is the master and which one is the apprentice? Welcome back, clobbering times. <laughs> sorry about that. But... Always two there Catch. are. There... So, the, so, because the way the boards work is the executive committee pretty much decides everything for the rest of the board, and the rest of the board just does what the executive committee wants to do. And the executive committee is Bob Iger and the ch chair that he selected, his buddy from uh, from uh, Nike, Mark Parker. So that's our overview there. So things are getting into the the war is on, and for those who have said for many years there's no internal war at Disney for the soul of the company, wrong. Mm. That war is right now heating up because here's like the thing: uh, the war was, for all intents and purposes, won by Team Iger. Like, for instance, the Lucasfilm Civil War, as far as I can see, lost. But here is now round two. The shareholders are fed up of seeing seeing their value eradicated on the altar of the woke cause, which, yeah. This brings about round two, but internally, mm -hmm. creatively, Team Iger won the intern the the creative civil war. So that yeah. war is lost now. Now, it, now it's a matter of can you depose the winning side and bring in uh, bring in sanity again? That's what this is really all about. Because yep. that's yeah, what well. else is going to have to do. Uh, because I think that they're hoping to 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 get in two to begin with. But probably they're planning on much more because really what you need to do here, you have to get rid of the entire board. You have to get rid of all of the Iger acolytes so you can get rid of Bob Iger himself because only then can you get any meaningful change done. 